Okay, yeah, our timelines are definitely messed up. I just learned that Oxford University in the UK is actually older than the Aztec Empire. So here's part three. And before we dive in, I just want to thank everyone who listened because we are number six on the charts. So when Oxford was founded, they still thought the sun revolved around the earth and they didn't know gravity was a thing for another 500 years. The last guillotining not only happened after Star Wars had already come out, but some of them were actually filmed. The last person to be executed by firing squad in the United States was executed the day Toy Story 3 came out. This one's crazy. William Shatner, James Dean, born in the same year. Harriet Tubman could have heard that the Titanic sank on the radio. And Shirley Temple could have had an Instagram account. And lastly, someone who witnessed Lincoln's assassination in person later went on to talk about it on a CBS game show. Victoria's BTK killer is a prime suspect in two unsolved murders. Dennis Rader, the convicted BTK killer, is back in the headlines after officers have been digging up his former backyard. The 1976 missing persons case of Cynthia Kinney from Oklahoma has sparked the search. The investigation has apparently uncovered possible connections to other missing people and unsolved murders. These have taken place in Kansas and Missouri, and police believe they are potentially linked to Dennis. The FBI are now looking at matching up pieces of evidence that they have with pieces of clothing that are in Polaroids that Dennis took. They may be able to then see if the pieces of evidence match the DNA of the victims. They are looking in particular at a distinctive red blanket, which was in a Polaroid that Dennis took. They believe that this may belong to Shauna Garber. Shauna was actually 22 when she was awed and killed in 1990. Her body was recently identified in 2021, hence the advancements in this case. This haunting security footage went viral after the death of social media influencer Mia Starr. It shows a masked man captured on CCTV moments before he burst into Mia's room while she was live streaming and murdered her in cold blood. And this was just before Mia was set to host a popular award show, which was by no surprise canceled due to her untimely death. And while an arrest for the crime has been made, case files suggest that authorities may have got the wrong guy. And many speculate that Mia's boyfriend Luke might be the man responsible. The case has since been reopened and now you can help solve the mystery of who killed Mia. This murder mystery game is an absolute must for true crime fans. And what I like most about it is that it has both physical and digital elements to the game, which makes it feel like you're solving a real life case. There are top secret files you can sort through and at one point in the game, you can actually use your device to hack into Mia's phone. And if you wanna check it out, they have it at Walmart, Amazon, Target, and of course, the link in my bio. Barbie has a much creepier history than I thought. I'm going to show you some theories about Barbie that have been keeping me up at night, and I cover all sorts of creepy and true crime stuff, so follow along. In 2010, Barbie released a doll that had a camera on her necklace as well as a video screen on her back. This doll has since been discontinued, but there's a lot of rumors about what happened to this footage when it was recorded. So people have always theorized that the footage was collected and sold either by Mattel or by someone more nefarious. And it's been mentioned how easy it would have been for hackers to collect and sell all this data. The FBI even put out a statement about it. Barbie also released and discontinued the Hello doll, which could listen to children and respond with over 8,000 pre-recorded answers. A lot of parents worried that these dolls were potentially recording their children and then selling that data. But this doll also has really concerning reviews. Like people say that the doll won't take no for an answer. Like if she asked if you wanted to hear a story and then you said no, she would actually push back and then just tell you the story anyways. And the doll would also ask really specific and targeted questions about children, like how big their families were and if they had any siblings. Was this doll just collecting market data on children or was it something much weirder? This teenager is accused of killing his ex then sitting in a room with her corpse for hours. 18 year old Natalie Martin was just like any other young girl letting her hair down after graduating. She was recently on holiday celebrating with a group of her friends after graduating Philo High School in Duncan Falls, Ohio. They were staying at a rental home in South Carolina. Natalie's ex-boyfriend, 18-year-old Blake Linkus, was also there with the group. The pair had actually broken up in February this year as apparently Blake had grown violent. On one occasion, he quote, took her and threw her across the room. On June the 5th, the day before her death, Blake and Natalie had apparently been arguing because he found out she'd been texting someone else. On the fateful night in question, the group had been out clubbing when Natalie decided to go home because she felt unwell. Blake also went back with her. 
Around 9am the next morning, Blake came out of his room covered in blood. He was shouting that Natalie wasn't waking up. Blake had seemingly stabbed himself in the chest after killing Natalie. When two members of the group tried to attempt CPR on Natalie, they said it was way too late, she was cold and stiff. This suggests that she had been deceased for a long time and Blake had seemingly sat in the room with her corpse. When I was 12, I took the lives of my parents and brother. I am Jasmine Richardson, and this is my story. I was born in Alberta, Canada in 1994. I grew up with my younger brother and we were a happy family. That changed when I met Jeremy Steinke, a man 11 years older than me at a punk concert. Jeremy had a tough life. His mom was an alcoholic. His dad abused him and he believed he was a 300-year-old werewolf. He was into the gothic scene and always carried a small bottle of blood with him. Jeremy and I fell in love, but my family did not approve of him. When my parents forbade me to see Jeremy, we decided to do something terrible. In April 2006, we decided to kill my parents. Jeremy killed my parents in our home and I killed my younger brother. We ran away, leaving our home covered in blood. The next day, a friend saw a body through our home window and called the police. At first, they thought I might be a victim too. But they soon realized that I was a suspect. They caught us later that day in a town about 130 kilometers away. I was given 10 years in jail because I was young. And Jeremy was sentenced to life, which means 25 years in Canada. In 2016, I was released from jail. Now, I live somewhere unknown under a new name. During my time in jail, I wrote letters to Jeremy. In those letters, I showed no regret for what I did. Instead, I told him I wanted to marry him when I was divorced. But a police officer asked why I killed my brother. I simply said I did not want to grow up without parents. This is one case that still haunts me. The story of the disappearance of Jason Jolkowski is one of the weirdest things that you'll ever read about. And it's haunting because to this day, this mystery has never been solved. So let's take a look at it. So this is Jason Jolkowski. He was born in 1981 and lived in Omaha, Nebraska all his life. And this story takes place in 2001. So on Wednesday, June 13th, 2001, Jason was called into work early. So initially, Jason planned on walking to his job, which was four miles away, due to the fact that his car was in a repair shop that day. But he eventually made plans for a friend to meet him at a high school that was nearby. So this high school, Benson High School in Omaha, Nebraska, was only half a mile from Jason's house, literally an eight block walk, and that's where his friend was supposed to meet him. So just take a look at this photo. This is the exact route that Jason was gonna take to the high school. It's only a 10 minute walk. And keep in mind, he was about to make this walk in the middle of the morning in broad daylight in a city like Omaha, Nebraska, where crimes like disappearances and murders don't really happen all that frequently. So at 10.45 a.m. that morning, a neighbor saw Jason helping his younger brother with the trash outside of his home. And at some point right after that, he left to go on this walk to go meet his friend. And during this walk, Jason vanished off the face of the earth. So to this day, no trace of Jason has ever been found. There were no remains ever recovered. Nobody has seen anybody that's ever looked like Jason. Nobody reported seeing somebody being abducted on the day that he went missing. Nobody even reported seeing anything out of the ordinary. It's as if he simply vanished literally into thin air. They even checked the security camera footage from the school that he was supposed to be walking to that day. And the security camera videos showed that Jason never arrived. It was somewhere on that half a mile walk when he vanished. Now, Jason's parents have suggested that they believe he may have been abducted and killed, but with no body ever having been found, that theory is just really hard to prove. And yeah, it's been over 20 years since this happened and no trace of Jason has ever been found. That's why it's a case that will haunt me. I mean, it's just scary to think that you can be making a half a mile walk in the middle of the day, in the middle of your city and go missing and no one will ever even find a piece of your clothing. Deconstructing Christianity is not a fad. 
Hey y'all, I'm Jordan. I was raised in a very devout Christian home. I was a worship leader for 10 years. I was a missionary and I am currently deconstructing my relationship with Christian culture and the Christian faith. And the fact that I'm doing this publicly and that I am documenting in real time my questions and what I'm wrestling with has caused a lot of Christians to be extremely upset, hurt, angry at me. Um, I get a lot of messages saying that I'm a stumbling block, that I'm just trying to cause strife, that I'm trying to derail people's faith, none of which is true. And just recently, I heard an angry Christian talking about deconstruction and how it's a new fad right now and that all the millennials in their 30s are doing it because it's a bandwagon and it's the chic, hip thing to do. And the truth is, yes, there is a huge movement going on right now amongst millennials, people in their late 20s, mid 30s, even up into their 40s of people who are completely pulling their faith apart, kind of like an old car that keeps smoking and keeps breaking down, you know? They're literally taking it down to the nuts and bolts and pulling it apart and going, okay, what isn't working? And yeah, I'm sure there are some people that are kind of jumping on it just because it's a talking point and it's something that makes them feel special. But as a general rule, I really do think that the deconstruction movement that's happening right now is due to the fact that there was an entire generation, my generation, who was raised in purity culture, rapture culture, end times culture, and worship culture that was extremely toxic. It was extremely unfounded uh, in biblical truth. And we were so ingrained and so indoctrinated that this was the way, this was the truth. And we were unknowingly raised through childhood to be full of shame, to be full of fear. And as adults, we are very anxious and depressed and have rock bottom self-esteem because we were told we're unworthy, we are nothing without God, that we are dirty, we're unclean without God. And the truth is there are adults now that are extremely dysfunctional that are having to go, okay, why am I like this? And unfortunately, a lot of the flashing red lights are pointing toward your Christian raising. So look, the word deconstruction doesn't mean necessarily abandoning your faith. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's deconstruction. It's I'm pulling this apart down to the nuts and bolts to see what isn't working, what is working, and to put it back together in a way that is more functional, that is more healthy. And however you put that car back together, if you are a more healthy, functional human being, cheers to you. Stepfather broke both of my legs. I'm Kelsey Briggs, and this is my story. I was born on December 28, 2002 in the United States. My mother's name is Ray Don Smith and my father is Lance Bridge. During my mother's pregnancy, they decided to separate. In 2004, my mother met Michael Lee Porter and they quickly moved in together with Michael's two daughters from a previous relationship. Hospital visits started very early for me and many bruises began to appearing all over my small body. My mother took me to my father, noticed many bruises while giving me a bath. He immediately took me to the hospital and contacted social services who found signs of abuse. My father contacted my mother and asked her questions, but she did not understand what was going on. In 2005, my custody was taken away from my mother and I was placed in the care of my paternal grandmother Brits. Despite this, my mother still had the right to see me from time to time. One day when my grandmother came to pick me up, I had a bruise between my eyes. My mother explained that I had bumped into a piece of furniture. Another time, she said that I had twisted my ankle. But when I was taken to the hospital, I still had bruises on my body. My mother dropped me off at my grandmother's who noticed that I was barely walking. On April 18, 2005, my mother married Michael Porter, and as days went by, it became increasingly evident that I still couldn't walk. My mother took me back to the hospital and that's when doctors discovered that I had both of my tibias fractured. When I spoke to a social worker, I said that Papa Mike heard my feet. The doctor explained to my mother that my legs had been broken with great force. On May 2nd, my custody was taken away from mother and grandmother both suspected of abuse. On June 15th, my custody was returned to my mother but social services continued to closely monitor her. 
On October 11, 2005, while I was with my mother, Michael asked Ray to pick up his daughters from school. When she returned from the school, she found an ambulance outside the house and realized that I was not breathing. I was declared dead at just two and a half years old. The autopsy revealed that there had been an abdominal trauma that caused internal bleeding. I also had several bruises on my arms, belly, back, and legs, and I had also been raped. One of Michael's daughters stated that her father was not sane when my mother was around and that he regularly hit my head against the wall. My mother was sentenced to 27 years in prison for failure to sister person in danger and Michael Porter was sentenced to only 30 years in prison. Thanks for listening to my story and don't forget to subscribe if you want more story. This OF model allegedly murdered her boyfriend in 2022. This is the story of Courtney Clinton. So before all of this went down, Courtney was a famous model on the internet, if you know what I mean. She had a large OF page and she frequently posted her travels around the world funded by her own endeavors online. She was also really into fitness and entered a lot of fitness competitions in the past. So at the time of this murder, Courtney had about 2 million followers on Instagram, like she was a full on famous influencer. And at some point in her journey, Courtney met this guy, Christian Obenselli. They started dating and it seemed like they had a really good relationship from the outside if you were somebody to just follow their social media. But friends and family knew there was a darkness lurking beneath the surface of the couple. They were fighting, they were always, you know, doing things to each other. And this would all come to a head in April of 2022. So initially, when the police were called to the couple's apartment in April of 2022, they found Courtney in there covered in her boyfriend's blood, holding his bloody body. This is how her hands looked upon her arrest. And yeah, she was obviously very distraught, but she initially claimed that she had stabbed her boyfriend in self-defense. And this is the angle that Courtney's lawyers have been going for the entire time since her arrest, that because of their relationship and the domestic violence that was happening in the relationship, Courtney had to stab her boyfriend because he had been attacking her that night. But then when the charges were announced against Courtney, prosecutors released this damning video from the elevator in their apartment complex, which clearly shows Courtney beating the hell out of her boyfriend, Christian. I mean, that full video is online, and it is very clear that Christian is trying to de-escalate the situation, and Courtney will not let whatever's happening go and is just wailing on him. Now, Courtney's lawyers in preparing for the trial have said that they've identified a couple of times when police have been involved in the disputes between the couple, and they claim that it's going to show that Christian was an aggressor towards Courtney. But Christian's family and attorneys obviously are claiming that Christian was the victim here of domestic violence. And on that day, when Courtney stabbed him in the chest and sliced open one of his arteries, which caused him to die, she was the only one attacking anybody in the apartment. So I'm really curious to see how this trial is going to pan out. And when we get some sort of an update on this, I will be sure to let you guys know what's happening. How young is the world's youngest serial killer? 20? 18? Even 15? This age reveal at the end of the story will shock you. Amarjeet Sada killed three people in separate incidences between 2006 and 2007, including two family members. This story takes place in India, and we're going to start in 2007 with a missing baby. A young woman had left her six-month-old baby in the care of a primary school, and when she had come back, the baby was missing. Now, of course, immediately this baby's family was frantic, and they all began pointing fingers at one individual, Amarjeet Sada. They're quoted as having said they knew he had a dark streak and he was not like the other boys his age. Villagers called the police and said, you need to speak to this boy. And the police initially dismissed them saying, there's no way a boy that young is going to know anything about that missing baby. Ultimately, the police listened to the villagers and tried to speak with Sada, and his parents were hesitant to let him speak to the police. And the disturbing fact is, the reason the parents were hesitant to let their son speak to the police was because they already knew that the boy had killed his cousin and his baby sister. They didn't bother getting the police involved with that, even knowing what their son had done, because it was a family matter. But eventually, after pressure from the police, Sada's parents did let him speak to the police. And it was at this point that Amarjeet Sada admitted to the police what he had done. 
While in police custody, Amarjeet was very cool, very collected, even asked for a biscuit at one point before telling the police that he had, in fact, snuck into the daycare where the baby was sleeping, took the baby out of the crib and out into the woods where he brutally beat her with a brick and strangled her. He also admitted to having killed his eight-month-old baby sister in the same fashion, as well as his six-year-old cousin. The father of this six-year-old cousin was one of the family members who kept Sada's crimes under wraps. Family loyalty was obviously a big deal in the Sada family. But again, with the outcry for this baby infant to be found, they could no longer keep a lid on this, and the monster that this boy was came to light. And the shocking truth is, this boy was only seven years old. This young boy was a certifiable psychopath. He smiled all through his police interrogation, had zero remorse for what he had done, and had taken a chilling delight in the pain that he caused these children before he ultimately killed them. India does not allow children to be sentenced to death or to even be jailed, and so he was put into a children's home until he turned 18. Sada was released, and to this day, he is unaccounted for and on the loose. That was my bad. That was my bad. I was, play I was, I was playing the game, and uh, I got butt down the phone. That was my bad. What? No, no. It's only me home. Okay, so this was just an accident. You yeah. called 911. But did you say you killed two people or something like that? Rainbow Six Siege. I had my head on. Okay, how old are you? 17. You're 17. Do you have a driver's license or no? Uh, no. Okay. I don't have a driver's license. Are you, we can walk back every where's your parents at? Uh, where? No, okay. No. Do you want me to talk to your mom? Uh, yeah, you can. You're not in any trouble, man. All right. If it's an accident. Hey, is this Elijah's mom? Okay. Yeah. Hey, so what happened is I guess he's saying that he was playing a video game and in the process of accidentally calling 911, he said that he killed two people, but he was talking about on the game. So we thought that there was a double murder. So we showed up to your house with a bunch of us. That's why we're here talking to your son. Okay. So there's nothing to be worried about. Okay. Yeah, I got we're, a call. Yeah, we're just trying to, we're, we're just doing our due diligence here, trying to figure everything out and make sure that everybody's okay because we have to do that when we get a 911 call. This week, a lifeguard in Malibu, California, opened up a barrel that was on the beach only to find a body inside, and now a homicide investigation is underway. This past Sunday, a maintenance worker at the Malibu Lagoon State Beach saw a black plastic barrel floating in the lagoon and brought it in with a kayak. He didn't open it at the time, but the next morning, a lifeguard on duty spotted the same barrel back out in the lagoon. He swam out and brought it back into the beach, and when he noticed how heavy it was, he opened it to see what was inside and that's when he found a man's body. The origin of the barrel is unclear, but it's possible that it was brought in with the tide from the ocean. The man's identity has still yet to be remained as well, and homicide detectives are now investigating and have not released many details. However, they did note that the foot did not look very decomposed, indicating that the body may have not been in there very long. Investigators are also looking into security footage in the area to try to determine where the barrel may have come from and who may have disposed of it. Like I said, they have yet to identify the remains, and the investigation is ongoing. But this is just so eerie, and I hope they can figure it out quickly. It's a moment in court that shocked everyone. The sister of a slain 13-year-old cheerleader dropping heart-shaped stones into a glass. One after another, the glass fills up until she reaches the number 114. This jar now holds 114 stones, one for each of the 114 stab wounds that my sister had to endure. Tristan Bailey, last seen wearing her cheerleader uniform, went missing on Mother's Day two years ago in Jacksonville, Florida. This surveillance video shows her at 1.15 a.m. She's walking with a 14-year-old classmate, Aiden Fucci. When police picked up Fucci for questioning, he posted this truly disturbing photo of himself in the back of a police car, giving the V sign with the caption, Hey guys, has anybody seen Tristan lately? He also posted a Snapchat video. Having fun. During his police interrogation, Fucci's parents scolded him for posting on social media. Yeah, the Snapchat that you did was not very smart. Not a Snapchat thing. It's all over, you're all over the internet, everywhere. 
Tristan's body was discovered in a secluded wooded area. She had been stabbed 114 times. Fucci pleaded guilty to first degree murder. At his sentencing hearing, each of Tristan's siblings and her parents all dropped stones into the jar. So impactful, it just absolutely stopped everybody. Complete quiet in court. Fucci presented this handwritten apology. I'm sorry for all the pain I caused the Bailey family. I know my apology will not fix anything or bring her back. That didn't sway the judge, who sentenced Fucci to the maximum penalty allowable under Florida law. There is only one appropriate sentence in this case. I sentence you to life in prison. Kids in this video look like a happy family filming a TikTok. One of the girls is adopted and what she does to her siblings will make you feel sick. This case has been compared to the movie Orphan. So on the 10th of December 2021, his father from the Philippines, his name is Cruz, he gets the type of phone call no parent ever wants to receive. At exactly 3pm, police inform him that three intruders have entered his house and taken the lives of his two biological children. 18 year old Gwen this girl, and 16-year-old Lewis. The pair had been brutally attacked by a baseball bat and hammer. Now, surviving the incident was their 16-year-old daughter named Janice. As you saw from the beginning, Janice was close to her sibling, often seen having fun, dancing, and laughing with them. So it was understandable that she was distraught. When police asked her what happened, she told them that three intruders entered the house. She was lucky enough to escape because she ran to her bedroom, but her other two siblings were just not fast enough. Now, Janice had only been taken in by this family five months earlier. She had formed a close friendship with Gwen and begged her parents to take Janice in. She told her parents that Janice was an orphan who came from a really tough background. And despite the family having limited resources, they agreed. And Janice joined the family. She was welcomed in and all seemed well on the surface. Now, this attack completely devastated the family. As investigators looked into the case, they noticed something very troubling. Nothing in the family home had been stolen and the weapons used against the two victims were actually owned by the family. In fact, the baseball bat had been stored in Janice's room, which means the thieves would have had to have entered the room. Police also found a bag of clothes belonging to Janice at the back of the house. Those clothes were covered in blood and she had specifically changed before police arrived. It was becoming clear to police what really happened and Janice was arrested. She ended up confessing. It must be noted that she had the help of two other assailants. As they looked into Janice's past, they realized she wasn't even an orphan. She was sentenced to 30 years in prison. So why did Janice do this? She'd been taken in by a warm, loving family after all. Well, the parents of the two victims believed Janice wanted to be their only child. She had done this out of jealousy. She wanted to be the only one who got their love and affection. My name's Harves and I talk about true crime cases. If you want to hear more content like this, I suggest you follow. I was the actor in the Power Rangers show, but most people don't know the disturbing acts I committed on two innocent people. What I did will shock you. My name is Skylar DeLeon and this is my story. I was the Red Ranger in the show Power Rangers. On the outside, I seemed like a great human, but on the inside, there was a deep disturbing side of me. One day I saw a listing for a boat that was for sale. I contacted the owners named Thomas and Jackie, and I expressed my interest in purchasing but asked Fee I could take a ride on the boat to see Fee I liked it. They seemed like great people and happily agreed, so I met up with them and brought some of my friends. I pretended like my friends were people who would help me run the boat, but little did Thomas and Jackie know that they were all former convicts. The boat ride started off great. Thomas and Jackie couldn't have been nicer, and they gave me a ton of boating tips. Once we were pretty far out on the ocean, me and my friends ganged up on them and forced them to sign the boat over to me or we would kill them. They reluctantly did, and once they did, I tied them to the anchor and threw the anchor in the water. That was the last of Thomas and Jackie. I would have gotten away with the time if my friends didn't snitch, and also Jackie tricked me. When signing over the boat, she purposely spelled her name wrong and that made the police very suspicious. I have been sentenced to life in prison and so far while in prison I switched my gender to female. Follow for more stories.